Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Yvonne here from My Hello Kitchen. We're doing a surprise interview. We didn't publicize this because we had a few things to arrange, but I am here with a very special guest, my good friend and poet, Shadab Ziz Hashmi. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I'm, I'm so happy to be talking to you today <laughs> on My Hello Kitchen. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, Shadab and I have known each other for several years now when we last did a program in Chicago together on the common topic of food, which was a very special project. And now we're both here in Southern California, uh, a little bit of a warm day today, alhamdulillah. And we have been talking a lot about our work as writers and uh, food and how we come together quite often on that subject. We've had a lot of wonderful meals at your house. <laughs> together. I've yet to cook for you, but um, you've been so gracious and so kind since I've come to California. And uh, I didn't realize uh, how much you guys love food. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and Shadav has introduced me to many writers here in the San Diego area, and I've just gotten to know you so much more. And and then I said, you know, we really should share you with the My Hello Kitchen audience because Shadab's work is amazing and soulful. And I've um, been very inspired by your work and uh, just your personality, your soul. And so today we're going to talk about her three books. Uh, well, we're going to focus on your latest book, Home. Uh, but let me introduce her a little bit more formally so you guys can get some information about her. You can look her up uh, online as well, and I'll put those links up uh, pretty soon. But uh, first, let's get to know Shadab and get to know her work. She's going to be doing some reading from her from her books. So it's a very special evening. Shadab Ziz Tashmi, a Pakistani-American poet and essayist, is the winner of the San Diego Book Award and the Nazim Hikmet Prize, and has been nominated for the Pushcart multiple times. Her books include Ghazal Cosmopolitan, Kohul and Chalk, Baker of Tarifa, and Qom. You can visit her website at shadabhashmi.com and see more of her work on Women's Voices for Change .org, and I'll put those links up soon. So again, Shadow, thank you so much for having me in your home, your beautiful, soulful, colorful home. And uh, let's just get right into it. Um, your work is so beautiful, and really takes us to different lands. It takes us to different tastes and textures. I feel culinary delights in your work. Um, and the last project we worked on, where I talked about food, you read from your books on the topic of food of Al-Andalus. Um, your, your, your focus is a lot on these faraway places and the history of food and your own personal experiences, your childhood uh, with food. And so I thought it would be <laughs> really interesting to get into your brain to tell us how and why do you write about what you do write about? What are, those are the two things I'm so interested to see, like how, how you tick as a, as a poet. What makes you tick? What makes you put those beautiful words to paper? So first of all, thank you so much for having me, Yvonne. It's a stroke of luck that you're here with me in San Diego. And <laughs> yes, so I feel very blessed. And uh, assalamu alaikum to you all. Um, it's just so wonderful to be here. Um, so, yes, we, uh, the first time we met, we just, it was such a wonderful experience to be presenting together about things that we love so much. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the culinary uh, history, civilization, language, poetry, everything coming together. Uh, how does it happen? Uh, you and I talk about places and traveling and the experience of food. And uh, of course, you know, you... Uh, talk about growing food and um, uh, different kinds of ingredients and how they come together. And it's a little bit uh, similar with my process. I am very interested in how language comes together and uh, what part food has in that. Um, so why food? Why, why do I mention food so much in my poetry and essays? I think the basic reason is that uh, food is so it's so central to our existence and it's universal, it is spiritual, it's political, 
And um, it's really on the most basic level, it's what brings us together. Yeah. And to me, it's a language that's, um, that precedes conventional languages. Mm -hmm. It's a language uh, that we share, you know, we fair, even if we don't know anything about a culture, um, the food from that culture speaks of the culture. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's nostalgia, which is a very common thing to explore for poets and writers. <laughs> you, do so, you do that so well. And I feel like I get to know you through what you write about your own childhood and your nostalgia. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I was just going to read a little bit uh, from this book, Ghazal Cosmopolitan, which combines poetry, poetic form, the poetic form of the Ghazal, but it talks about um, uh, Urdu and, and the Ghazal form from the context of um, uh, food as well. So not just food, but all the sensory things. Uh, food is a very sensory thing, you know, yes, and, and, and that's one of the things where, uh, where poetry plays a part, that uh, that's the connection. Because um, it, it, when, when we experience food, we're experiencing the, the the aroma, what it looks like, the textures, we touch it. I mean, all of the all of the senses. And that I feel is your talent. When I read your work, I feel like I can be that my senses come alive because you you do such a beautiful job of evoking the emotion that food brings out in us. And I feel like I can hear your voice and I can taste what you're writing about. That's such talent. So I'll I'll let everybody uh, experience you now. Thank you, Avon. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit from uh, this essay called Silk Road Sherbet. And this sort of brings together all my other work as well, uh, because I, uh, I'm i very interested in cultural overlap and how, you know, Al-Andalus, Muslim Spain, the presentation that Avon and I made together, that had a similar theme, which uh, was about the Abrahamic cultures coming together in Europe in Spain. Um, uh, under Muslim rule, and that was that went on for 800 years, nearly a millennium. Nice. So um, uh, the the Silk Road history is a little bit similar. It's a lot of different cultures coming together, and uh, the Andalusi culture is called La Convivencia, and I call the Silk Road culture a moving convivencia because it's um, because it's a, it's a route. It's, it's called the Silk Road, or Silk, or actually, or Silk Roads. Um, so it's many, many cultures, many civilizations, many histories intersecting, and of course, uh, bringing together uh, combinations of culinary experiences as well as language. So Silk Road, um, so Silk Road Sharbat. A recipe written on a clear glass samovar of Ottoman Sharbat remains with me long after the trip photos have been downloaded enjoyed and forgotten. The place is the tree-lined alley in Istanbul's Sultan Ahmed district between the mosque and the Grand Bazaar. At an artisan fair, a mela, as in Milu, are coming together in Urdu. Small flowers and fruits float with crushed eyes wafting behind the words. Transfixed like the letters on the urn, I say the names out loud in Turkish and English several times, recalling their linguistic cousins in Urdu, Persian, and Arabic. Later, I collect the missing names from friends and complete the list. So I'm going to read you. Um, the, <laughs> I'm going to read you five lists, um, and um, you'll just hear the same word, and you'll hear echoes or chiming sounds in, in these different ingredients. Okay, so first I'm gonna read the English and then I'll, I'll uh, and the, then the rest. So pomegranate is in Turkish, nar, in Urdu, anar, Persian, anar, Arabic, roman. And uh, raspberry, ahududu in Turkish, rasbari in Urdu, tamishk in Persian, and Tut Aliyuk in Arabic. So the list goes on, and I'm just going to read the, the rest of it in English. So pomegranate, raspberry, tamarind, cherry, ginger, strawberry, rose water, rose hip, cinnamon, carnation, clove. Mm. 
So variations of sounds as well as place tags, such as Tamar Hindi, from which tamarind comes, Arabic for the date of India, Tut Firangi, strawberry, Persian for, for Frankish or foreign berry, Dar Chin, cinnamon, or the Chinese tree bark, symphonize history with the music of everyday names, mm. evoking the times of the Silk Road, centuries of commerce and civilization, confluence, clash, and eventual commingling. The ancient Qissa Khani Bazaar, or the market of the storytellers, is the first fragment of the lengthy history of the Silk Roads I learn about. Peshawar, a gateway to India, an outpost of the famous trading route, remains the small city of my childhood with half the heart of a trader, the other half split into storyteller and warrior, due perhaps to its geography and imperial past a fierce restlessness in its air. My last home, a few miles away from the Khyber Pass, overlooks the Hindu Kush mountains through which Alexander the Great entered India. At age nine, I visit the Grand Bazaar of Istanbul for the first time, en route to America and England. The gorgeous copperware and carpets remind me of Peshawar and the heaps of hazelnuts and chocolates and the itinerant cats of Istanbul are vaguely Western. I have the correct impression that I'm at a crossroads, though I have no clue of its historical significance yet. Wow. So you take us all the way back to your childhood in that excerpt. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, this is a mem So this book has memoir essays as well. And then Comb is a hybrid memoir. Uh, that combines, as you know, it combines poetry and um, uh, short pieces, uh, sh short essays, and so on. Where, where did you... Um, it's one thing to have memories, but it's another thing to collect, store, and process, and then share them with the world. So how is it that you are able to, or, or wanted to ever, push these memories out to the world to share um how did you to how did you collect all of this and and you know we all have memories from childhood maybe not as colorful but but it's a it's a real talent but it's also a desire inside right. to to do that so tell us a little bit more about your your reason for sharing all of this so Yvonne when I came here I came here as a student and in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And as you know, uh, the pol politically things were changing, especially for Muslims. I was, uh, you know, I grew up uh, as a Muslim in Pakistan. And um, when I, I, I had been writing poetry, I'd been publishing poetry as a young person in Pakistan. So before I came here, okay. I was writing in English and I was publishing in Pakistan as a young student. When I came here, I continued my writing, but I learned things about uh, about how I was viewed as a Muslim oh. in 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 the U.S. You know, in that in the academic setting, and then outside of it, when I moved here, um, you know, after marriage. Um, so it it it's been a long process of uh, you know reading and researching, of course, the different traditions, uh, you know, traditions that have to do with Islamic cultures as well as the Western culture, um, but also uh, responding to uh, different events that happened, mm -hmm. you know, uh, before 9-11 and after 9-11. I was a mother um, on 9-11. I had two babies. I had, you know, it was a moment where, um, you know, I, uh, all that, that I knew, it just came into, um, I, I gained perspective mm -hmm. on all all kinds of different things, but of course we keep gaining perspective sure. as you know we experience life in all right. kinds of ways. Uh, what's my process? My process is I, uh, you know, writing uh, nostalgic poems or autobiographical poems. Um, that's something that many poets do, you know, because we are we're we're introverts. We are introspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and we uh, learn about the world from how I mean, we, we process whatever we experience and then we write about it uh, from a personal point of view. And then 
uh, everything that I was reading and uh, experiencing, not just in books, but also traveling and um, just considering different cultural uh, interactions throughout history. Uh, because being a migrant, you know, I this was a cultural interaction. I mean, all these years that I've lived in the U.S., that's a cultural interaction sure. for me. Uh, my second book, Coal and Chalk. Uh, do you yes, have I have a copy here. Yes. So this book, uh, this book is a, a sort of uh, uh, many of these poems are it's a collection of poems, and many of these poems are written in response to Islamophobia. I was uh, raising my my children um, in in you know we, uh, th this is a generation that's now grown and you know they're they're college kids now, but um, uh, the poems were written in response to drone attacks and wars and um, a, a lot of the um, uh, the the language of uh, othering that we experienced mm -hmm. um, and uh, so so. It also, uh, this, the, these poems also contain my own memories of growing up in the time of the Soviet war. And that's a, that's a theme that is a recurring theme because it's part of my childhood. And the latest book, Comb, uh, sort of, you know, this is, this is the book that I, that I really talk about um, my, my childhood during the time of the, of the Soviet war. Well, you also, I think, um, you, you must do some uh, quite a bit of research on history because you you know so much about al Andalus, about the Ottoman Empire. That's how we kind of uh, came together. It was sort of our love and passion for, for that time period and uh, the food of that time period as well. But um, I think people who read your work can also can find themselves learning things that uh, they may not have realized were occurring in those time periods. So you must... You must do quite a bit of research to to make sure that it's all. Um, I, I'm always fascinated by that because I'm. I thought I knew a lot about Al Andalus or Ottoman Empire, but reading your work, I'm learning more and more um, about those time periods. And I think for Muslims, we we kind of look on those time periods as uh, um, you know so fondly. We look at those time periods as so things were were beautiful, things were uh, colorful, things were delicious. I mean, we, we look at all the food, but, um, you know, it, it had its, uh, it, ha it had its place in history and now here we are. And so you have, you have a good balance of, of historical that we all can look at, but then your own, your own memoirs of your own history, I think weave and tell a story that is personal, but that so many of us can relate to, as you mentioned, uh, you know, times of 9-11 and things like that. I mean, maybe I couldn't express the feelings, but you do such a, a beautiful job of, of expression that makes us feel like less alone in those emotions. So I, I, I really got that sense when, when I'm reading your work that, uh, oh, I, I'm not the only one who who felt those feelings, but I just didn't know how to articulate them the way you have. And so you, you really, um, you, you know, you've, you've done a great job of uh, that expression that many of us can't do. So Thank you. Yeah, that was very important to me. Uh, the research, as you mentioned, uh, took many years. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to research not only the, uh, the, um, the history you know, of uh, the, the political history, but also um, everything else, the, the cultural history in all kinds of ways. And this was very exciting for me because uh, the intellectual history of this time period is so robust and it's so energizing. And um, all the years, uh, I mean, so I began this, this project when I was in college and it took me two decades to complete it uh, because there was so much to research. Right. A millennium right. is a long time. <laughs> and um, and yeah. the beautiful thing about this uh, period of history is that um, uh, this brought together, uh, you know, the three Abrahamic people in a very beautiful way. Right. Right. And so uh, that syncretic culture has a lot to teach us. Uh, it is a part of human history that's very admirable. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I think that, the years that I was writing, the years of intolerance and war and like, uh, you know, year after year, we were going through this kind of trauma mm -hmm. uh, on different levels. 
this this history gave me a lot of joy uh, because you know uh, uh, other than you know so there's not just not just the the history but also the tradition of music the tradition the culinary tradition yes yes um, the tr- and uh, architecture mm-hmm. you know the the history of um, scientific uh, the scientific research you know medicine and all this just reading about all of these things um and the place of women in that history right, right. so uh, and you've traveled to these places and i think that's something else we both have in mm-hmm. common is that sort of maybe as writers those places are very inspiring the environment is is uh it, it evokes your emotions it makes you want to write it makes you right. uh feel motivated mm-hmm. to share what is is bubbling inside of you that you want the whole world to, to, to know more about. And uh, because of those uh, architectural structures are still there and many of the culinary delights are still there. Mm-hmm. It's something we can still kind of feel in touch yes. and romanticize. In absolutely. A way. Absolutely. You know, that experience, the firsthand experience mm-hmm. and that firsthand experience uh, bringing about nostalgia and cultural yeah. nostalgia. Right. You know, I mean, we weren't around, right. you know, a thousand years ago. <laughs> right. But but to know that these uh, in- ingredients were coming together from all over the world into Spain. I mean, mm-hmm. this was a yeah. this was a time when, you know, Baghdad was um, you know at its it was was having its own golden age, and uh, there was so much, uh, bit, you know, there, there's so much interaction between different lands between yeah. different people and I when I talking about Andalusi food I think one of the things that that really excites me is um, all, all the all the desserts that were being prepared <laughs> by yeah. the three Abrahamic uh, faiths and, mm-hmm. and they made their uh, own cul- you know individual culinary traditions mm-hmm. uh, uh, but the ingredients were really coming from different places sugar originally came from Malaysia you know, it oh, traveled. Wow. It traveled. Uh, it traveled the silk. It, it was always the same routes that you know. The you know, or even even sea routes that brought things from the east to the west. Um, and so, sugarcane. Sugarcane was first grown in in Malaysia, and then you know. So you have the Arabs all of these grabbed it up and right. Yeah. So when when we did our project together in Chicago, that was one of the recipes we had. Was the marzipan right. stuff yes. dates. Yes. And that was a, a that was a um, a nod to Jewish and Muslim uh, culinary uh, innovation right. coming together, mm-hmm. right? Because of the different ingredients and that they were you know acceptable for both uh, to to mm-hmm. have. So it just was really interesting how much of the overlap was there. Right. And and Muslims coming from sort of anywhere in the world, I think uh, get excited about this because we feel like there's something we can relate to in that right. and there's something positive rather than traumatic. And you, you, you touched on the word trauma and mm-hmm. I just, I'm, I have to um, ask you because I, I this wasn't one of the questions, but uh, does the, does the writing help process any um memories of, uh, of having to leave home or, or the, the pain of having to leave home, the emotions. I mean, as we sit here, we're, we're, we're watching people go through that right mm-hmm. now. Right. And that's why I bring it up. I wonder how much um, the writing helps people to process some of that trauma. It absolutely does. I think writing is very therapeutic. Uh, again, it's something, a, a poem is something that can be shared and, uh, you know, uh, it, it's such a basic human, it, it satisfies a very basic human need, uh, yeah. the, you know, words being used to comfort or to mm-hmm. even uh, to uh, express the trauma, express the pain. Uh, mm-hmm. they're, they, they offer healing, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, to the writer and, and hopefully to the, the listener or the reader mm-hmm. as well. Uh, there's, there's personal trauma. And absolutely, I think my memoir touches upon a lot of themes um, uh, of, you know, childhood anxiety and how I, you know, how I processed it and, mm-hmm. and what were the things that helped me mm-hmm. overcome, uh, you know, anxiety and growing up in a time of war where, uh, uh, you know, living, uh, we, I grew up in Peshawar, which is along the border of uh, Afghanistan. So 
seeing the suffering of refugees firsthand and uh, you know a lot of things that I was exposed to as a very young child mm -hmm. uh, you know seeing uh, people who were uh, you know injured in war and all of those things that were very much uh, was very much in your face experience for a, right. for a child that can be a very traumatic thing. And so mm -hmm. I talk about how in my home life, I was dealing with those things, those experiences. Mm -hmm. So uh, writing the memoir, uh, you know, helped me to sort of process. And that's why, you know, your, your other question was about, uh, about why the book is called Comb, uh, you know, uh, this is combing through memories to process them mm -hmm. and co combing through geography and history. That's another thing. Places wow. and how they come together, what separates us um, and what brings us uh, together. Well, so, at the very least, I also think that um, you, you, you may be helping yourself so much when you're writing to help process the whatever uh, traumas you may have gone through. It also, I think, bridges that uh, gap of understanding that people who never have gone through anything like that, mm -hmm. or or there is, um, you know, this this um, Islamophobia or right. or just uh, xenophobia in general of, of lots of different cultures. Mm -hmm. When when someone ha has the courage to write about their experiences that someone else cannot even fathom, it's it's just preserved on these pages that anybody can go to a library, pick up your book, read it without having known you personally, but, but yet come to some understanding mm -hmm. of what you've been through and what it's like for the other. Right. So I think that's where your work is also takes on a, another level of importance that mm -hmm. uh, uh, we may not be talked about enough is that that real empathy. Um, sometimes, it, you know, it can't be, done person to person because people are not willing or able to to sit down with someone right. different from them or having a different experience or or they don't have the opportunity to but just by reading your work they can start to understand mm -hmm. and uh that you know serves such an amazing purpose in this world so um, thank you thank you for saying that that uh, aspect means a lot to me because um, again, my first experience was on a, a, a college campus in an academic setting where I felt that uh, there were only like a handful of Muslim students on campus. So, you know, and uh, it, it's uh, uh, it's very hard to sort of become a, a spokesperson person for this huge, big thing. Yeah, it's, it's a heavy <laughs> Which responsibility. Is, it's, a he it, yeah. it's a heavy responsibility, yeah. but I think it, to me it was a gift because it made me do all that research it made me uh, I became interested in uh, Islamic history and you know and, and the cultural history of Islam wow. and the intellectual history of Islam and so it gave me the opportunity it, it wasn't a, a comfortable position to be in it was a position of uh, you know I mean, there was so much hostility even yeah. in the 90s you, you know yeah. that whole debate of clash of cultures was going yeah. on yeah, exactly. so it was a it was a very uncomfortable position to be in uh, at that time we didn't have I mean now we have a generation later we have so many books so many resources <laughs> uh, so many uh, opportunities to learn about islamic history mm -hmm. in the west uh, but you know at that time we had these, of course, we have a fabulous history of, uh, you know, intellect, literary history, intellectual history, but how many books did we have in Western languages right. a generation ago? Right, right. And now we can, right. And now we can find uh, books on any subject, yeah. uh, especially there, there's such a wonderful proliferation of uh, original Islamic, uh, you know, uh, uh, or, or I should say, uh, books uh, about or coming from the Muslim cultures. Mm -hmm. They're not yeah. all Islamic books, but that too, you know, yeah. books about Islam, books by Muslims on various subjects, on almost every subject, you can find books in English. Yeah. And this is the part that this, this is what matters to me um, that, you know, um, you know, of course, the tradition in Arabic, Persian and Urdu and all these languages is yeah. very old, but it's not accessible to people yes. in the West. In the, exactly. Right. And this discussion is going yeah. on in the West. So yeah. Yeah. so we have to have, um, you know, we have to have that discussion 
in our voices as Muslims. Yeah. We have to we speak for ourselves. Yeah. And uh, the, doing all that research about Al-Andalus and the Silk Road, um, these are these are huge themes, and I, it's very yeah. humbling to you know it's a huge period of history, and also it's um, it's so many different geographical places coming together. So it's yes. a lot to learn, yes. Yes. but to begin that process of learning uh, was was a wonderful opportunity. Well, I, and uh, yeah, I think in the '90s there was quite a bit of bias um, mm -hmm. post 9/11. I think. Uh, discussion started breaking open um, and, and that was a positive side effect um, and most Muslim voices now are becoming um, it, it seems like people they're allowing that platform for Muslims to really open up and to be told on you know from our side mm -hmm. and that that's a really good thing mm -hmm. um, I do but, but you know, like when I look at the culinary history of things, I think when I was in Turkey, I was I was so interested in looking at the Ottoman Empire and the culture of food. But um, you know, even there, it was really hard to find a lot of books in Turkish mm -hmm. that would tell the story in because English, of its own right. historical right. problems. But mm -hmm. but uh, you're right when you say you know, like the, it's important that things these things happen in English because. Mm -hmm. um, the West needs to hear that narrative as right. well. But I think this that this happens as a result of interest. Mm -hmm. So I think the more people that are interested in these topics, the mm -hmm. more there will be demand for it. And certainly that history is just so colorful and delightful. And But it does need to be told from a Muslim's perspective. And, right. And, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we, we uh, hear ourselves being discussed. Yes. And, uh, you know, uh, and but we don't, but there... Uh, you know, there were no opportunities to even be part of the discussions ourselves. Yeah, that's changed. You know, that's that's changed a lot. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. That's I, and I'm I'm very excited for the new generation because there's so much now that they can access, um, and they you know information, uh, history, you know all kinds of things that they can and they want to. There's mm -hmm. so much interest in the younger generation yeah. to get to know about. Uh, the, the different Muslim cultures. Mm -hmm. Also, the fact that the different Muslim cultures are so different, they're, they, they yeah. give, there's <laughs> such a variety, they're so diverse within right. themselves. Um, and, and so there's, a, um, so I think, I think I'm very excited about, you know, the next generation, what they'll do, because um, this is, this is a very good time, I think, uh, I, I think to, um, um, to be in touch with them because we, we, we went through hundreds of hist uh, years of colo uh, his history of colonialism. So I mean, so we're living, Muslim cultures are sort of uh, living post-colonial times and they're still figuring out where they are, you know. Yeah. Um, Do you think food, um, well, the way I, I see it in the, in the food world, and like, when I say food world, I mean like um, I see the young people really interested in um, food like Pakistani food or Afghan food. here in California you've got so much Afghan food Persian food uh, even the fusion mm -hmm. of things and you know I see young people really excited about that and interested in that and I think that is a really positive nod mm -hmm. to the future that mm -hmm. they're not looking at it from a political perspective right. or they're looking at it like hey, this is interesting, it's delicious, it's different, but their embracing of it really shows their, their open-mindedness and mm -hmm. their um, ability to see past all of the, the stuff that kind of generations before kind of really couldn't let go of, you know, there right. was, it was so heavy. But now I think what feels so positive is that food is kind of that one thing that's helping push past Absolutely. A lot of the, that. Absolutely. Do you yeah. see that? I mean, you have small kids, and mm -hmm. well, they're not small, but you have you have children that uh, are at that age mm -hmm. where they they could be experiencing all of mm -hmm. that. Do you see them uh, being so different about their perspective on the world? Um, I agree that younger people are interested in what the authentic flavors are. Yeah. What yeah. they they're now drawing a distinction, and I think globalization is coming of age. Also, yeah. there yeah. was a time exactly. where you know, it was okay for something to, to, to call something fusion and not even care about what yeah. the authentic is. But right. now having that, having those distinctions has become uh, very important. Mm -hmm. Young people do have an understanding 
of um, if something diverges from the original, you know, the authentic flavor, or I mean, food or in other things as well, they want to know how, why it's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, they're interested, right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you know, what is what is uh, something that, you know, the, 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 the authentic version of something mm -hmm. because there are so yeah. many versions which is right. also not a bad thing i mean right. alandalos the culture any culture that's syncretic um you know even uh, the south asian cultures that are synth uh, syncretic like uh, you know when we talk about urdu that's syncretic it brings together all these influences mm -hmm. so so of course there is a third thing that's coming into being and it's it's obviously it's it's authenticity is diluted mm -hmm. But then to, to know that there is another version and to seek that version also, I think that's very much there. And I think the internet has, you know, we must give credit to the internet for that. <laughs> and, and more young people are traveling to, to right. different places. You know, right. they don't, they're not just going to, um, you know, your typical tourist places. They're, mm -hmm. they're going to experience uh Places along the Silk Road. I mean, right. that's a whole other topic. But but yes. I think it's fascinating that that there is that interest in places with so much history mm -hmm. that um, they can find a piece of themselves in in each one of those mm -hmm. places. And I feel that way personally, just mm -hmm. by way of being Muslim, by way of being you know Sicilian and Hispanic. That like when we talk about those regions, I think instantly of who who might my might my ancestors have been, what mm -hmm. what part they might have played. Uh, how do how does the food I grew up on resonate with that history? And so that's why, you know, your work is just so delicious in that sense, because I I, I, I feel um, a sort of a nod to my own cultures and also that it's sort of like a permission, not that we need it, but it's it's like you've given us a permission to to um, embrace it again. And it's not just stuck in history books. But you're bringing it alive, literally, with that aroma of of the food that you talk about and the places you you travel to, uh, you take us to in in your work. So, um, I don't know. I think I think that's just my personal take on it, and I hope everyone else will ex be able to experience that as well. Thank you for saying that. I think you use the word embrace, and that's very much what you know. I when I think about these four books that are very different from each other, um, that they, they all they're all concerned with pluralism, with you know their uh, uh, their anti-tribalism. It's like you know they're, yeah. they're the whole the, the the biggest gesture in all of this work is to um to get to know one another you know yeah. i mean to yeah. have uh, to um to sh to actively share you know uh, our different cultures mm -hmm. and this goes beyond muslim culture of course this goes sure. this goes beyond sure. you know um beyond any confines of of uh, you know race religion whatever it's, well it, it it's uh, the histories are not simple Right. They're rich. They're right. rich with flavor, rich with spice, rich with with the uh, with architecture, like you said. And I think you 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 really uh, help us to appreciate all of those layers that are in our history, rather than being reduced to just um, people from that part of the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's not that simple for anybody, let alone you know Muslim cultures. Uh, so I think giving that appreciation is really important because the, it's worthy of that discussion. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very worthy. So I know we went off on a little a tangent here because it, it's just so interesting. <laughs> Everything that you've done is so interesting, but let's focus on comb. I know that mm -hmm. that was what we really wanted to talk about today. This is your, your latest collection of poetry. Mm -hmm. And you did mention uh, the reason for the, for the title, which mm -hmm. Is, is really beautiful. Um, now tell us, tell us more about what we can find what, in inside and what, what influenced you to compile this, this piece of work. And we're gonna also read, have a shit, I'll read a little bit from, from Comb, but can you just tell us more about what we can um, find here? So some of these poems um, in this hybrid memoir, um, you know, or autobiographical poems that are that I mean, they're, they're, some of these pieces are pieces that I've been write, writing for a while. They're published at different places. Mm -hmm. 
um, I wanted to assemble them in one place. And uh, of course, I used the metaphor of, of comb and hair uh, because I wanted, um, you know, sort of like a primary metaphor to ground the whole, the, you know, the whole memoir. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, I think if, if I had to say, you know, what the main, there are the many like themes and sub themes in the book, uh, but, but one of the main things is um, borders. Uh, mm -hmm. I grew up, I was born in Lahore, which is the, the city between, or the city along the border of India and Pakistan. I grew up in Peshawar, which is along the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And I've lived in San Diego for more than half my life, which so is a border, border mix, right? <laughs> um, and so uh, I talk about geographical borders, but I also talk about temporal borders. I talk about time being split. So I talk about my childhood, my early childhood, talk about growing up, and I talk about um, uh, migrating. I talk about marriage, and I talk about how, uh, you know, I talk about cusps. So what is the meeting point? Mm -hmm. So there are geographical meeting points. Borders separate us, but they also unite us. Right, so exactly. it's two ways, yeah, two ways of looking at the right. same thing. Right. And then, of course, there are cusps between languages. You know, I, uh, I am, m many different languages have been part of my childhood. And I write in English. I, I love Urdu, l Urdu literature and, uh, you know, so, I mean, all of those different things that sort of are together and apart. And so this book sort of explores that whole idea of being split. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's both because it's a good thing and a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it depends how you look at it. I mean, right. certain parts of your times of your life, you look at it positively and other times. Exactly. Yeah. But, uh, but that's the, the journey of a human existence, right? Is right. Going through all of it. Right. And combing through the, right. the uh, parts of life that uh, we have to experience to, right. to live our lives. So mm -hmm. um, please, uh, so I, I, w I was hoping, there's so much in here that I wanted to, <laughs> to, to explore, but I've chosen just a, a, a few places that mm -hmm. I thought would be most pertinent for our discussion. There's, there's just so much here. Um, would you mind reading the, the essential, like the beginning part of the uh, Calm, which is so so you need you you titled this uh, what this next reading um calm mm -hmm. so was, was that sort of like the first um uh, not chapter but sort of, sort of the introduction right yeah you're, you're introducing us to the concept of calm. yeah so this is a very short a uh, very short piece it's prose it's not poetry it's a very short piece that sort of it, is a it, it's meant to work as an introduction mm -hmm. so should i read this yes one? please please Comb, one breath away from invasion, one page away from a new chapter of empire, Peshawar, the city with an open door, the bab -e khaber for a symbol, houses a guard in its heart. As a final threshold of the corridor between pursuers of power from the east and west, its location is a curse. Being history's blank preface, inked by empire again and again, its guard is perpetual, no matter who enters. It is my hometown. And it was as the Soviet war began across the border in Afghanistan and chaos bubbled up invisibly, erupting from an overheard sentence or caught in a suspicious silence or in flashes from the seven o'clock news that froze in my head that I could no longer wake up without stomach pain. It was then that the breaking of combs began. Wow. That gives us a very, very visual impression of sort of the beginning of sort of the untangling of life in a way. Right. So, yeah. so that had to be seared in your memory for you to write that. Mm -hmm. So when I was coming up with the, the, I, the main idea, the main metaphor for the book, um, comb, um, the, the, there's this very, significant memory of um, breaking combs <laughs> because yeah. as a child um, I, I was I had so much anxiety as a little child six seven eight year old child 
that I used to, you know, when I would comb my hair in the morning, the combs would break <laughs> because, um, because of uh, some kind of anxiety and fear that my parents couldn't figure out what exactly it was. But I was absorbing a lot of um, uh, trauma from my surroundings. And I think one of the, the, uh, the, sound, the, the sound of bombing, the sound of uh, fighter planes and seeing, uh, sure. seeing maimed children, because I was a, a, a young person myself, um, I was very interested in why young kids were, you know, um, uh, were maimed. And if I, if I, yeah, but when I found out that it was because of uh, landmines, that was a very wow. uh, terrifying thing. So the, these little things, that little snippets, I mean, war was not my firsthand experience. It was an experience that I experienced it through, uh, you know, um, the refugees and, um, and the people affected uh, by the war. Um, and so, so anyway, so that little uh, memory sort of became, uh, it's one of the things that I talk about, but then I talk about... Um, um, being on TV as a as a young child, and I, there's a there's a <laughs> there's a chapter called hairspray, and I then saw. yes, <laughs> yeah. So so these uh, all this the images are images related to hair and combing, untangling you know knots and uh, um, hair hair jewelry and you know so on and so forth. Um, so I assembled all of these pieces. And I wanted them to be short. I wanted mm -hmm. these memories to sort of just stitch together whatever was significant rather than go into details that were, you know, that are not, that are not directly relevant. Mm -hmm. um, and I, again, so from the point of view of being at a crossroads uh, and, uh, uh, you know, being between things like the, the idea of the cusp, um, I talk about um, leaving Pakistan as a child, as a daughter, and then becoming a mother in a different country. So I talk about mm -hmm. yep. those shifts in, you know, and um, uh, then, of course, you know, I talk about, um, um, I mean, I talk about my growth as a poet and the different, la the, the multiple languages that I grew up with. Um, uh, and so you know, they're all so different from each other. And well, you're a very sensitive soul, and I think people who are more empathetic will absorb right. all the energies around us much easier. Mm -hmm. But in your case, you've not only done that, but you're able to um, collect and and share without having to, like you said, you know, you, you don't share the details that may seem irrelevant. But what you do in such a short amount of time on the page is really poignant and really um, gets that emotion across in a way that I, I think, uh, you know, it, hel it helps me understand myself in some ways. Like I'm reading it and I, I don't have that same exact experience, but I have others that are similar. And I think well, that's the emotion that I feel elicits in me, even though it's not my experience, but you, you, you've helped to, you help to shape um, an understanding of, of something that millions of people go through similarly in different parts of the world. So even though there's like cultural difference and time difference and space difference, everyone can relate to something that you're saying. So, so in a deep level, I oh, think that thank is you so much for saying that. <laughs> That's, that was the intent. Yeah. Um, and very much like food, very yes. much like the idea of food. Yeah that um, it, it brings one to, it brings people together at such a basic level, yeah. you know, at that, yes. Um, yes. you know, it really, it really does away with borders, you know, mm -hmm. or b between differences between uh, it, you know, the uh, actual bonding can, can happen, mm -hmm. you know, with food. Um, and so, so it's this, this exact same, same concept with, uh, with all of this, you know, all of, all of this exploration, mm -hmm. like what is it uh, that creates a split and what is it that, yeah. you know, that brings things together? What is, where is the seam where we meet? So the point is always, where is the seam that, we're, you know, that not to see the cracks, but to see the places where we are, we are joined. Yeah, let's look, looking on the brighter side. I mean, we right. are all humans going through this human experience and, right although we may speak different languages and come from different culture, cultures, religion, when are we going to get it right that 
<laughs> really at the end of the day, yes, we're all humans mm -hmm. with the same desires and needs mm -hmm. and many of the same overlapping experiences, but just maybe look differently on the surface than mm -hmm. it. So um, very well said. I got a really, uh, I have to say, uh, your, your, your um, section called uh, Shaping Ramadan really uh, made me smile uh, because I did not grow up with this experience at all. I didn't grow up uh, celebrating Ramadan or fasting. And so I don't have the, the childhood memory so this was such a gift. <laughs> it was such a gift. And I, and I, it made, it just made me smile how you put words to your um, childhood experience of, of the preparations of, that your mother was making of, of the iftar. So would, would you mind sharing uh, any part of it, but especially the last two paragraphs, I just thought they were so delightful. And with Ramadan coming, mm -hmm. I think everybody <laughs> could really enjoy uh, listening to this. Okay, so from here on? I think from here is good. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so this, this uh, essay is called Shaping Ramadan. It is the month of Ramadan. I have many notebooks of summer homework to fill, but the heat makes it hard to concentrate. I study the pattern of the tablecloth, the occasional lizard on the wall. The swinging door to the kitchen startles me every now and then as my brothers come running through it. They use motion to navigate the world. I reverie. We balance each other's energies and are most in harmony in the Lokad or Guava season or in Ramadan when the family bonds over iftar, the meal at sundown, typically consisting of dates, lemonade or lemon barley squash, mango milkshake, pakore, chickpea fritters, spicy fruit salad, samosa and other snacks. There is a certain aroma associated with the fasting season owing to this traditional menu. It is the aroma of festivity and fatigue, chatter and silent meditation. I love that. So would you like me to read yes, the last, the last one? Yes, the last one is, is, okay. is delightful. At age seven, I insist on keeping my first Ramadan fast. I'm old enough to practice a bit of self-discipline not old enough to appreciate the full meaning of fasting, that slight detail having to do with enhancing the spiritual life. <laughs> the day is immeasurably long. I stand by the window to watch the slow day wilt. I give my mother a long and badly spelt list of treats for iftar. She cooks every single item and finds the misspelt list too amusing not to say for posterity. <laughs> I add drawings to my menu triangular samosa, coils of orange jalebi, round parate. It will be important for posterity to know the shapes and colors of Ramadan food, I imagine. <laughs> I just loved that so much. Uh, I, it, I just had visions of you as a, as a little girl, you know, uh, sort of uh, sitting at the table, trying to concentrate on your homework <laughs> and, and the, the hustle and bustle of, of cooking going on in the backgrounds for Ramadan and it's mm -hmm. and it's just it's just beautiful that it's so simple but uh for somebody who maybe doesn't understand that sort of the rhythms of Ramadan there mm -hmm. you know people who, who've never experienced it they don't know what we really do mm -hmm. uh what we cook and how different we are culturally but you just give mm -hmm. this window uh, open it's like you're you're letting us into your your world your childhood um, and that's a very personal space. So mm -hmm. I appreciate that so much. <laughs> Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad to hear these things. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, on a personal level, we, we talk a lot about food, recipes, okay. uh, culture, traveling. But um, reading your work and helps me to know you more. And it also helps me to appreciate uh, part of the world that I, I didn't experience as a Muslim and, and and I'm always trying to learn more about our own history and and the culture of my friends and and the people I care about so you you've done such a service as and also for for people who um, dare I say kind of wonder about Muslims maybe they even fear Muslims God forbid mm -hmm. but but that happens and I think um, showing the beauty of everyday life of mm -hmm. but also this is what we've 
gone through. This is what right. we've experienced. And this is maybe why we do have some anxieties. And right. This is why, you know, we, we may not talk about it. We may not share it. You may not see that on your Muslim neighbor's face or, mm -hmm. or experience, but um, get to know get to know people more yeah. on a deeper level and you will find this rich history. Um, I would say that particularly for anybody who's moved country mm -hmm. um, and they can't always articulate everything in, right. a, in a new language. I, I experienced that when I was in Turkey mm -hmm. that it's so frustrating to not be able to tell people who you are, mm. what you're, what, what you like uh, mm. to, 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 um, what you would like to maybe, you, you would like to know about them. Like maybe you'd want to make uh, a cake or invite mm -hmm. them for dinner. Uh, you try to, you know, get to know people and you, you can't on a deeper level because of the language barrier. And it's so frustrating because people can't know that sense of who you are mm -hmm. without language. So all respect to people who come from different countries and, and, uh, they have a whole life behind them somewhere else but you may not know that because it's so hard to articulate right. sometimes absolutely so absolutely. so yeah i just um th there's a lot of there's a lot there's a lot to be to be said for all of the gifts that you're giving us in in your work um so you dedicated this book to your father mm -hmm. i wanted to know uh i know your family is very very important to you um but why in particular your father did you dedicate the book to him so after all these years of, of being a writer, uh, you know, and I look back, I, I think that the one person who always supported my writing was my father. Um, it, uh, he's not an artist or a writer. He, you know, his uh, background is in finance and business. Um, but he was always, I mean, I think what, what every child needs is a good listener and somebody mm -hmm. who's paying attention sure. and who... Um, who makes you believe that whatever you're thinking and feeling and saying, um, it's important to it's important to them, mm -hmm. and in some way, it's also it's it's important in general as well mm -hmm. that you have something to say. Right. So so just as a your child, feelings matter. Your feelings matter, and your thoughts, and your you know whatever you're exploring. Mm -hmm. Um, even at the level of being a very young child, and you know where you're just just having. A, a kind of respect, even when you're, you know, you're as anxious a child as I was, uh, and uh, as vulnerable, you know, and all of those things. Just having someone who accepts those things and who uh, makes you believe that um, that 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 your words are worth something, mm. that your thoughts are worth something, yeah, um, and it just. I think the fact that my father has read all the drafts, even the it's such a boring thing to do to read <laughs> drafts and to to look at like half baked ideas, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. and give and especially for somebody who's not. I mean, he's a very well read person, but he's not a literature person, right? Mm -hmm. So it's um, and sometimes it's a challenge for him to get into a poem because that's not part of his experience, right. uh, you know. Um, but he'll, he'll do it, you know, he'll, you know, and so just when I finished the last draft, in fact, the, the same week, he had a stroke. And oh, uh, so this is, funny. yeah, this is two years ago. And uh, I had, he, the, the final draft, I, I, cause I used to email him all the drafts. Oh, wow. and, um, uh, and you, so every time there's any good news about my writing or publishing, he's, I always, I want him to be the first one to know <laughs> and and so on. So uh, as, as I was finishing this, it just, you know, it struck me that that one person who is, uh, and thankfully he's recovered and, you know, everything is fine. But um, uh, there, there was a period of time where he couldn't remember language. He couldn't uh, come up with words he could understand, but he wasn't speaking, you know, um, just as a, an effect of the stroke. Uh, but I just felt like that was a time that, you know, it, this all of this was so emotional, uh, putting together my my memoir, my childhood experience, my childhood, you know, memories and so on, that um, that I just, I, you know, I thought was the, that, that was, yes. Yeah. <laughs> wow. 
Well, that's a that's that's a really good segue into my last question for you, which is, um, you know, this world is full of uh, distractions. It's not always easy to focus on writing um, or any mm-hmm. kind of work. But and the, and, the, and young people today have a lot of uh, options in terms of uh, well, I should say, young people today kind of. Um, not all of them want to go the traditional route of studying uh, medicine or engineering or, or, or business. They want to do something alternative, something maybe more artistic and creative mm-hmm. and writing and poetry could be one of those. I, I saw that a lot when I was a teacher that a lot of the kids said, you know, I, I want to do something uh, inside of me that's, uh, um, but my parents don't really want me to do that. And um you know, that's always a hard uh, thing to address. Um, mm-hmm. So what would you say to young people who aspire to be a poet, a writer uh, of any sort, um, something, you know, in the literary arts, w- what advice would you give to them? <laughs> so it's famously <laughs> difficult to make a, make a living out of, you know, literature or art. Mm-hmm. But can human beings live without these things? No. We, in every culture, in every t- period, time period in history, we have had the arts, you know, whether it was, you know, cave paintings or poetry or song, <laughs> whatever. Right. And now, you know, it's, uh, we have sophisticated ways of making art. We have, you know, um, we have all kinds of media and we, all kinds of collaborations are happening. It's a very exciting time to be yeah. a, a person who's involved in the fine arts. Mm-hmm. But the, the hardship of you know making ends meet is still there and it's there in every culture it's still a a very challenging thing to do so we often have to um is sort of you know we have to figure out a way to make a living by either teaching or you know doing something else and i mean you know historically there have been so many um so many writers who actually they've written, I mean, so many people have written about this hardship <laughs> of doing something that you don't like just so that you have, uh, so, so that you can still do what you do like doing. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, that's also a very common human story, right. of, you know, right. trying to, where as far as work is, uh, is concerned, I think that uh, a creative artist has to be creative in order to, uh, bring together those two things you know making a living is very important (laughs) and then doing what you're doing is definitely very it's very meaningful and satisfying to the person who's doing who Mm -hmm. is uh, engaged in that creative activity but it's very important I think for for everybody I mean it's to me it's really like it's like food water and air yeah, <laughs> you know it's a necessity <laughs> it's a necessity you know i mean think about the the most traumatic things that have happened that we've gone through shootings and war and all those things yeah. what happens in the end there is uh, we come together in a prayer and what are what's a prayer prayer is words someone put those words together so that all of us can share our feelings and you know share a moment of solidarity right mm-hmm. Or we, or we sing, you know, again, these are words and music coming together. Mm-hmm. We eat. That is food. Every time that, uh, that we go through something significant in our lives, these are the things we do. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we grow food together. We cook together. We eat together. These are human experiences of bonding. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, same, same goes for words that, uh, that uh, they're necessary. And that, you know, if, if we all chase after, I mean, making a living is important, but but um, making material material goals a goal in life that's a little bit. That's where you have to think. You know, what is how how am I really bringing meaning into? Mm-hmm. We have this short life on this planet. How are we? Right. <laughs> you know, there's money and there's meaning. Right. So what do we? You know. Um, uh, where do we um, place a priority? Mm-hmm. So as far as parents are concerned, um, I myself, I, mean, I think my, my kids have all had to, you know, sort of uh, uh, resolve this uh, for themselves also, and they're still doing it. 
but I would I have always supported them as far as you know uh, I mean it, I think the arts make you human they 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 validate our humanity um, they make us unafraid of vulnerability and and feeling mm-hmm. vulnerable I think confronting vulnerability is important and then getting over it is important and I think the fine arts are a really significant way that human beings learn to do that you know to uh, not be afraid of showing vulnerability right. and also to be able to overcome it by having engaged in a, in a in the creative process well when we're really guarded we're not uh, allowing for communication to go through and what right. is communication but words that are spoken right. or written and um, and the sharing the empathy the sharing, yes and the empathy and again that's another thing that's in common with food and uh, and language and literature is that um, and that the sharing of it is all important you know the mm-hmm. sharing of it and what happens when it's when uh, when when that sharing takes place um, uh, that this act I mean I would call call it you know when when you talk about civilization uh, on one level food is so basic on another level um, it is so uh, central to Uh, to civilization, to who we are as a species, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's a a big force that has shaped us into Mm -hmm. who we are. Right. And it it, it becomes part of our identity, you know, when we um, see certain recipes or certain foods, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, we certainly can identify or evoke memory and they're just, it's so important. And and also I think um, there's so many ways that people can, be part of the literary arts today. It's right. not, um, you know, there, there's, there's, like, it's so important, for example, just to have good reporters, for example, right, right. now, in, in all the things happening in the world, if, if somebody didn't take the leap to be a journalist and mm-hmm. uh, put their lives on the line, literally, to report stories, we wouldn't have those words coming through the TV to tell us what's happening. Mm-hmm. So everyone, um, I feel, could, you know, in their own way, channel the talent to right. something that uh, fits their personality and actually make absolutely. a living to, yeah. to do that. So. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. I think in our times, uh, there are possibilities uh, for this enterprise to grow in, in different ways. Mm-hmm. It's in more creative ways. I mean, we have technology. Uh, if it weren't for technology, we wouldn't be right. able to do <laughs> what this. we're doing. Exactly. And then exactly. also, you know, the past two years have taught us that, um, uh, even with social distancing, with all of the, you know, with all of that, we were still able to, uh, it was such a blessing to be able to connect, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, uh, yeah. via technology. Yeah. So uh, technology is absolutely part of, of the fine arts today. And I think it's going to keep. It's a really it's, great point. Right. It's, it's, I think it's going to, 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 uh, to help it along to, you know, to make this grow. I think that's where, that's the beauty of the fine arts. It, there's, it's um, uh, innovation is at the heart of all the fine arts. You know, what I mean. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree. And and today more than ever, we can kind of take control of that. You know, through doing this ourselves, through self-publishing. You know, there's. Mm-hmm. But I always think, you know, um, I heard it once when I was when I was young uh, and contemplating, you know, how to write mm-hmm. and put my. Uh, thoughts out in the world and I, and it's just that the there's the power of the pen mm-hmm. there may be lots of powerful forces in the world but uh, Allah Almighty first mm-hmm. and then the pen is a very powerful thing whether that's the you know the keyboards on the laptop or mm-hmm. whatever but but um and, and you are an example thing. you're Thank an you. example of that your work is powerful it has so much meaning and depth and importance in our world today more than ever I would say, and I just uh, hope that everyone can experience, uh, everyone who's watching can experience what I have just by by reading your work and knowing you um, and that you'll share this uh, with, with everyone who you think or may not even think who would be able to, um, uh, you know, appreciate and benefit from this conversation. So I'll put links to all of Shadav's books uh, later on in the comment section. And... Um, yeah, so thank and you so much. It, this, you. this was lovely. I'm so happy we were able to finally do this. And uh, now we're going to have a nice dinner. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it's time. It's getting. It's getting time. We're always. We're always thinking about the next uh, time we'll meet for food. <laughs> but I've yet to cook for you, so I will do that. Inshallah, one time soon. <laughs> Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a gift to the world. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you for, for doing this. Okay. So that one, thank you, everyone. And uh, see you soon. <laughs>